conversation, because we're going to do it as a conversation. Three panelists, and I think I'm going to introduce them in the order that they'll be speaking, because the format will be that they'll each speak for, I believe, as Ian told me, about five minutes of an opening uh, statement, opening remarks on the topic, and then we'll have a conversation amongst ourselves and open it up for um, Q&A or discussion or comment, and all this before 8.40, when we're going to finish, okay? Uh, first, let me welcome to the podium Dr. Kofi Hope. Kofi Hope, is a, Kofi Hope is a Rhodes Scholar, Doctor of Philosophy in Politics, Community Activist, and Youth Advocate. He has over 15 years of experience in managing community-based programs. Kofi was the 2017 winner of the Jane Jacobs Prize for his work improving the City of Toronto. In 2005, he founded the Black Youth Coalition Against Violence, a group which advocated for real solutions to the issue of gun violence. This advocacy work included a presentation for then Prime Minister Paul Martin and led to his being named one of the top 10 people to watch in Toronto in 2006 by the Toronto Star. So we're watching. Previously, he was executive director of the CCEE Center for Young Black Professionals, a nonprofit organization which creates economic opportunities for black youth in Toronto. He's delivered over 125 speaking engagements in Canada and the UK. At your age, and you must have been talking almost every day. <laughs> He was co-chair of Olivia Chow's Election Advisory Committee in 2014 and is a member of the Board of Directors for the Atkinson Foundation and Toronto Environmental Alliance. Kofi has been featured widely in the Canadian media, including Metro Morning, Canada AM, TVO's The Agenda, Ontario Today, The Toronto Star, The Globe and Mail, The National Post, and CP24, a global traveler he has visited 22 countries around the world, and we're glad that he calls Toronto, Ontario home. Kofi will begin at the Wesley Institute in September in the position of Senior Policy Advisor. Welcome, Kofi. And Dr. Nadia Hassan. Nadia Hassan PhD in Political Science from York University. She is the Deputy Director of the National Council of Canadian Muslims, an organization that I'm delighted to work very closely with. And she's part of the Senior Management Team leading the NCCM's Organizational Development Program, Management and National Operations. Nadia has a diverse background in teaching, project management, and the not-for-profit sector. Nadia has several years of experience working on policy and programs at Canadian think tanks and NGOs, and she has taught university courses in South Asian studies, religion, and gender. Her doctoral research focused on Muslim women's organizations and the practice of Islam in Canada and Pakistan. Nadia is a published author on a range of topics pertaining to Canadian Muslims and Muslim popular culture. She previously served as the NCCM's program coordinator. And the third panelist is Rabbi Michael Sachs. And, and we weren't aware until recently that he was going to be our third panelist. I'm delighted, and he didn't give me a bow. I'm, so I I'm, one, I'm one of the rabbis here. <laughs> I need to give you just a little personal touch of an introduction. Um, as Rabbi Michael told you, he has been here at Holy Blossom for five years as our associate rabbi, and I was particularly delighted 
that one of the um, assignments or portfolios that you had was the intercultural work. So that brought me into working closely. We're going to miss Rabbi Sachs. On June 1st, there's a farewell party, and I'll even miss that, which is why I was delighted to be coming uh, tonight, uh, because we congratulate you, Michael, on going back to the States, but having your own congregation. So congratulations. And so now, without further ado, I'm going to uh, invite, we have a, a microphone there, and I'm going to invite each of the panelists, uh, starting with Kofi, and then Nadia, and then Michael, to give us your introductory remarks on counting hate and prejudice, solidarity, peace, and social justice. Good evening, everyone. I'm going to try one more time. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Thank you. It's good to be here with you tonight. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit about this theme of, of social justice and what it means to build a society that's socially just and the role of faith in it. Because to me, if we're talking about countering hate and a world without prejudice, if we're talking about a place where people really live out solidarity across communities, then to me, that are, those are all components of a socially just world. And, you know, I'm a person who believes that that struggle to build this world is not simply a secular struggle, but is actually aligning ourselves with the divine calling and connecting ourselves with the work of our ancestors to build a world as we were supposed to live together as brothers and sisters, um, together as one blessed community. From a Christian perspective, which I was raised in, this is you know, what the work of Jesus of Nazareth was, this thing called the kingdom of God, a place where the last would be first and the first would be last, a, a reordered society based around equity and principles of inclusion for all. Now, one of the things that's always important for me when we think about our larger society and how we reverse the tide of hate and the growing um, intolerance that's happening and when we think about the role for religion, is I believe there's a large role for religion, or for really people of faith. And I think it's also important that we think of this divide folks talk about between those who are spiritual and those who are religious. And of course, spirituality being that individual uh, journey and struggle with the divine and understanding our purpose in the world, and religion being living out that spiritual journey in a community, uh, and but also the organizations and very human organizations that are created around this. And I think sometimes um, if we look and think about the role of faith in our world, simply from a perspective of religious involvement, we can think that you know faith doesn't have a large role in these social movements in Canada. Certainly religious groups are there, but they're not always the largest actors. On the other hand, if we look at my daughter's a couple years older than that little one. Um, if we think about individuals in Canada and what the polling says, while the majority of people today, and especially young people, are not actively involved in faith communities, it doesn't mean these are folks without faith or folks who are atheists. The majority would actually be these people who would say, well, I'm spiritual and not religious. Folks who their understanding of a soul, of a creator, of the purpose for life, of perhaps an afterlife, that these things are part of who they are, but they're not part of a lived community experience. And why it's important to recognize that role is because how you think about these deep spiritual questions in many ways shape your values. And almost all of the research you can see these days in psychology will show that it is our values and the emotions they trigger that lead to our actions, right? Many times, and we've had a long tradition in the West that said it's all about rational thinking. You've heard people say, oh, well, you know, they'll look at the election of a certain president south of the border, or there are things happening, and say, oh, only people could be more rational, and there's, you know, too much emotion. And the reality is, actually, almost every decision we make is driven by our emotions. They actually look at folks who've had damage to the parts of their brain that regulate emotions, and they don't turn into, like, you know, uh, Mr. Spock from Star Trek or these folks. They're not some kind of logic computer. Folks who don't have access to emotion actually struggle to make any decision. 
These are folks who are almost unable to get out of bed because every single decision they make from will I step here, will I fall through the floor, what will happen, what will go on, takes a huge cognitive toll. Really 80% of our decision making comes from our unconscious mind. And that's why values are so important because this really provides the fuel for the emotions that lead to what we do. So why does this matter? If we're looking for folks to become involved in movements to counter hate, to work for social justice, then we need to speak to those values and we need to speak to those emotions. There's a man named Marshall Gantz. Uh, he's a professor at Harvard University. He's done a lot of work. He worked with Dr. Martin Luther King. He worked with Cesar Chavez. And he was one of the kind of gurus behind Barack Obama's Organizing America campaign. And he writes in depth about the importance of stories and values in getting people to work for a bigger world. He writes much of it within the Jewish tradition and talking about how within that tradition the importance of storytellers as leaders and folks who work for justice. And he's done a lot in depth to talk about how leaders can think more about the importance of these stories. And so when I think about the growing hate in the world, the growth of these far right movements and how we build a movement to counter that, for me the importance is well, we actually need spiritual and religious voices speaking to what's happening and using the ancient wisdom traditions we can pull on and using our understanding of these deeper values to motivate folks. There was recently, I saw in the New York Times, an analysis of language in America. And they found that as religious participation has declined, so did a certain amount of words, both in books and popular culture. And some of them would be, you know, those kind of churchy words you would expect, you know, around kind of redemption and sacredness, but they also found as religious participation went down, so did works like words like forgiveness, compassion, charity, generosity. In fact, it is our faith traditions which provide us with a deeper understanding of some of these key terms that are at really the heart of our humanity. And so I think it is so essential in these times that interfaith action and the action of spiritual leaders is bold, but also inclusive and welcoming, but using these terms and these values to motivate folks, both those who are religious and those who are spiritual. At the same time, I would say, it's very important that we think about our own traditions, because to me, religion is a contested space. As much as there are folks who use religious traditions to build this kind of blessed community, there are folks who use it to divide, like any other area of human activity. You know, it's always amazing, for myself, when you look at the history of social movements in Canada, almost all of the charities in this country, the work around women's suffrage, the work around the abolition of slavery, the work around ending uh, the use of nuclear weapons, the work around ending the apartheid regime in South Africa, all of these movements had origins in faith communities. Even our whole uh, infrastructure of human rights comes from spiritual ideas about the inherent dignity and sacredness of every human life. On the other hand, I take within the Christian tradition, the same churches that supported sufferettes when they were marching for women's suffrage, within that same tradition, people used the Bible to justify patriarchy and sexist ideas. Just as the abolitionists pulled on the Bible to mobilize for the black freedom struggle, so did slave masters use that same book to justify slavery. Just as folks uh, mobilized under leaders like Desmond Tutu in South Africa, thinking about black liberation and ending the apartheid regime, so in the Dutch Reformed Church, they teach children every Sunday that racism was right and that white supremacy was actually ordained by God. And so for us, as we do this work, just as important as it is to engage with the larger, more secular world and draw them in with our values and our stories, there's also that work, of course, within our own communities to push forward understandings of religion and the divine that are inclusive, that are welcoming, that build around solidarity, and that counter hate. And I think as we do that, both talking within our communities and without, that is where we can see concrete action. And that's where I, in my own life, have seen some of the most inspiring work. I've had the honor, I worked for a year for the United Church of Canada, doing interfaith and intercultural work, bringing people together from diverse traditions, from First Nations spiritualities, people from Muslim communities, Christian communities, to talk about justice and change. And I tell you, the power when you assemble a room of folks 
who come from different walks, but all have an understanding that we are called to build a better world and to live together in solidarity is powerful and I truly believe is unstoppable. So I commend the organizers of tonight for putting this event together and I look forward to exploring more deeply how together as communities of faith and as spiritual people, we can work to build a more inclusive world. Thank you.
like I came to this country because of these are things that I value. Um, and it's scary that they're under threat. Um, at NCCM, what we're doing is we're trying very hard to figure out the various angles through which we can combat what's happening uh, in Quebec right now, including, you know, how will we legally challenge the law. Um, but one of the things that we're, what we're really focusing on right now, and I think this is something that, you know, the IEI is really contributing to, uh, and I think Holy Boss Blossom Temple has a tradition of contributing to, and that is just changing the story. Like, we need to change the narrative about religious minorities in Canada. We need to change the, the way we talk about, the way we think about religious minorities. The fact that Islamophobia and anti-Semitism often, and Karen just mentioned it in her, in her opening remarks, that these are two things that often go together. Um, and these are, these are actually the, the like, anti-Semitism is the foundation, the reason why we even have uh, uh, rights and freedoms. This is the reason why the UN and international law uh, created human rights, is because of what can happen when dangerous thoughts like that get out of control. Um, now, I, I think what's happening in Quebec is something, and I'm sorry to harp on about this, but this is really, it, it is a couple of weeks away. By mid-June, this will be law in Quebec. By mid-June, um, we will be second-class citizens within Canada, uh, within a province in Canada. Um, and it should not be acceptable to anybody. Um, what we're seeing alongside this, and this is where the whole point about changing the story becomes really important, the point about like having conversations and teaching people and having events like this where we can dispel myths and really kind of show people the human side of what uh, faith groups are about. Um, this is important because what we're seeing in Quebec right now is since the introduction of the bill that is going to, is, that is actually going to take away these rights, we've seen a spike in hate crime. We've seen a spike in Muslim women walking down the street um, and people trying to pull off their hijab, someone trying to push someone in front of a bus, a truck literally trying to run somebody over. Um, these are incidents that we have heard, like at NCCM ourselves, we've taken these women and accompanied them to the police station to report these crimes. Um, but these are all products of something bigger than the law. Right? Like those are things that are happening because people harbor these ideas, these prejudices, and hate in their hearts, and we need to find ways to kind of work against them. Um, I think I'm running out of time now, but I did want to kind of close on the fact to say that I know this is a little, a little bit doom and gloom. Um, I'm sorry if that's kind of sounding the alarm a little bit, but I do want to say that it is possible to change this. It is possible to reverse this, and I think what it requires is that we all just pay attention we pay attention and we stand up. We don't be bystanders, bystanders in this moment in history in our country. Um, and what that means is that often it means that we have to put ourselves in, in uncomfortable positions um, where we have to tell somebody that what they're saying is wrong or what they're saying is hateful and hurtful. Um, so I encourage you all today, and, I, and for those of you uh, who are fasting throughout the month of Ramadan, to think about that. Um, as part of, you know, as part of our faith, part of our faith, standing up for justice is a huge part of the Muslim faith. It's a huge part of all faiths. I think it's something that we all have in common. So I really implore everyone to kind of think about that um, as you think about how you might be able to help um, in changing this sort of this, this strange turn uh, in the history of, of uh, religious minorities and faith groups. It's a unique time in Jewish history right now where the majority of Jews, the vast majority of Jews, live in democracies, live in a place where they are individual citizens. My great-grandparents, their generation came up from the States, came to the States, but it's a similar story in Canada, came to the States about 120 years ago because they were living in poverty in Tsarist Russia. They were not considered citizens. They, they, uh, Jews could be attacked by government forces. The police happened. And they came to America because America welcomed immigrants. A couple decades later, by the mid-20s, 
America and Canada no longer welcomed, no, they welcomed some immigrants, but they did not welcome Jews anymore, specifically. So my, my great-grandparents' cousins, who did not come to North America by the 1920s, by the 1930s, they could not leave. And then they were killed because they were Jews. So we are blessed, Jews, to live in countries that are democracies that we're seen as equal under the law. In these last four or five generations, since my uh, great-grandparents came to America, Jews have totally integrated into North American society. Uh, Jewish cultural norms, cult jokes, food, all of these things are part of North American culture. Everybody eats bagels. It's a blessing. Sorry, I shouldn't talk about that before, uh, before night, sorry. <laughs> We'll talk about it after. But it's, it's a blessing to be a Jew at a time, and this might cause controversy, and we can talk about it. And I'm not saying that there isn't problems with this, but there is a, a state of Israel that can protect Jews around the world. It's a blessing for Jews. But at the same time, in my home country, 2016, the person who won the presidential election had a commercial with three Jews saying that these nefarious people are trying to control your money. George Soros was one of them. Now when you see George Soros, or when people around the world, in places like Hungary where he's from, uh, around Europe and America, when you see George Soros, is that supposed to be because he's a, uh, a financier around the world? No, it's supposed to be because he's a Jew. It's a blessing to be a Jew in democracies right now, but at the same time, as, as Nadi mentioned, 11 Jews were murdered in Pittsburgh. And six months later, a Jew was murdered in, in Poway, California. That Karen, I'm sure Karen knows the numbers, but anti-Semitic attacks are on the upswing in America, in Canada. And just, it was either today or yesterday, a government official in Germany said Jews maybe shouldn't wear kippot outside because it's dangerous. Another government official said, no, we should all, non-Jews, also wear them. <laughs> Jews are leaving France in huge numbers. And it's a great time to be a Jew, and it is a scary time to be a Jew. Anti-Semitism can be, can morph into all different kinds of uh, uh, forms. Rightists, far right people can be anti-Semitic because Jews are cosmopolitan. Jews are the cultural elite. Jews don't have any loyalty to any to the country they live in. Jews, you can add to them. The left can hate Jews because Jews are really just agents of Israel. Or Jew, Jews don't care about this country because they're loyal to Israel. Or Jews, uh, and I know she apologized, but a member of Congress intimated at that, a member of the U.S. Congress. Uh, Jews are the communists, and Jews are the capitalists. And five years ago, I would have said, oh, this is fringe talk. But it seems to be coming, be, becoming more mainstream. And that's scary. Now, I don't, as a Jew, that what I focus on is, is Jewish life, but I, I want to broaden this. When in a society where Jews are not safe, pretty soon others won't be safe. And in a society where others are not safe, immigrants, refugees, today, maybe Muslims, pretty soon Jews will not be safe. I do want to end on, on an uh, optimistic note, though. 
as I said at the beginning, the vast majority of Jews lived in democratic societies. And in democratic societies, even though it's hard work, the individual has power. An individual in coalition with others has more power. And individuals working to together, coalitions coming together can make change. And that's why uh, I, I dedicate much of my time as a, as a rabbi to, to build coalitions, to work with others, uh, to, to affect change.